Coming up today, we've got some issues with powdery mildew on squash. We'll talk about some remedies that can help rid that issue. And we'll take a look at one of the success stories we have in our garden, growing produce in burlap sacks we got from a local coffee roaster. All that and more coming up today on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener is sponsored in part by for all your non-GMO organic and heirloom vegetable flowers and herb seeds visit dollarseed.com Sioux Growing Supply located in Wausau Wisconsin focusing on certified leaf compost an excellent amendment for poor soil retains moisture and adds nutrients which equals less water available in labor saver pre-filled trays and pots, bag and bulk. Visit SueCompost.com. Organic fertilizer for the health conscious organic home gardener. Family owned and operated. Visit WGardens.com. Don't poison your soil with municipal water. Attach a body, mind and soil hose filter. Free shipping exclusively through the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. Just click on the body, mind and soil icon. Authentic Haven brand, soil conditioner for the home gardener. Easy to brew. Visit ManureTea.com. No measuring, no thinking. Stamp it, plant it, stop plotting, start planting. GardenStamp.com. Welcome to Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. I'm Joey Baird. We are in the large garden day. We are in the squash bed to begin with, and we've got a problem. We've got powdery mildew on our Squash, we've got spaghetti squash, we've got some confection squash, and we've got some other varieties in there. Powdery mildew. Now, powdery mildew is this discoloration on the top of the leaves. Now, this is a contributing factor to mild temperatures and moisture, whether that be rain or high humidity, let's say during the daytime, and then very cool, cold, almost nights. And this is what has transpired over our squash. Our pumpkin, our volunteer pumpkin we spoke about on the program, as well as our cucumbers. Now, there are a number of homeopathic type remedies that you can exercise on this application. We've got our information from a host of Growing a Greener World on PBS, Mr. Joe Lampo. That link will be in the show notes below. He's wrote a great article about some of the ingredients that you will have in your home right now that can greatly reduce and in some cases eliminate the powdery mildew on your plants. We went with one remedy, the milk and water remedy. We've got our Hudson Spurry here filled with a combination of one part milk and two parts water. Now the milk can be 1%, 2%, it just has to be milk, real dairy milk, not soy milk or coconut milk or anything like that. So what we are going to do is apply this just as a mist on the leaves. We're going to try to cover all the leaves here. Now more in this application is not better. Just don't sit there and soak and soak and soak. Get the leaves moist, get them covered, move on. That's what we're going to do here in our squash bed. All right, so what you need to do in a is look under the leaves and try to spray the under portions of the leaves as well um, to capture and coat all of the leaves that you possibly can with this milk water mixture because these powdery mildew gets on both sides of the leaves. And I know based on the size of some of your patches of squash and cucumbers it may be a very difficult task to get in and get all the leaves covered but what we hope to achieve by doing this is one bring the health back to the squash plant and help it survive until all the fruit on the plant has reached maturity this is you want to do this, perform this application once weekly until one, the end of the season, or two, you have 
fixed the problem and got rid of the powdery mildew. So I'll work on the other side here and then we'll move up to the cucumber patch. Now you also want to spray, you know, we've got the spaghetti squash down here that's heavily, uh, got a lot of heavy mildew on it, but over here we've got some confection squash. Now it's a hybrid, it's not as affected. Uh, I'm not really seeing a whole lot of anything, but I'm spraying the whole patch. Now you can fix this problem next year by maybe looking at a more resistant mildew variety, or you can just, you know, pay attention. Sometimes you get mildew, sometimes you don't. So it's just something that you, as a home gardener, will have to decide what's best for your garden. All right, so I'm up here in the cucumber patch, trying to cover all the leaves, bottom and tops, the best I can. Now we've got three different varieties of cucumbers growing in this particular patch here, and some are more susceptible to that powdery mildew than others, but we're gonna cover everything the best we can, and then we'll come in here again in, in a week and reapply it. Then we've got one more stop to make up on the high end. All right, so we've got a combination of butternut squash here, and then this one here is the pumpkin that was a volunteer. And we're very pleased with the success of it because we've got a pumpkin right now, currently the size of a volleyball. And we're just gonna coat all of this down the best we can to Try to at least slow down, if not eliminate the powdery mildew. And this may be cropping up in your garden. And again, the link that we are following the information from, from Joe Lample, is in the show notes below. And it tells a number of different remedies that can be very successful in your home garden. Pulling your weeds out of your garden, throw them in the compost pile or the trash pile. It may seem like a very obvious decision on a gardener's part, but you might want to consider a few factors when determining which pile your weeds go in. We are in the potato patch here, and we've got a bunch of these thistles here that have many, many, many seeds as the wind blows, and they'll fly away, and a lot of these have already been dispersed throughout the garden. So what you want to decide on is, does your compost pile get hot enough that if you, whatever can you throw in it, will it kill the germination of the seeds that you put in that compost pile? That is a 160 degrees Fahrenheit for three consecutive days. Ours does not reach that temperature based on that we don't have enough browns to carbon, or carbons, which are browns, and greens, which are nitrogens, enough of a balance to accelerate the internal core temperature of that particular compost pile that we have. So you don't have to throw all the weeds in the trash. You could separate the, the piles and have one that you know have seed pods, because what happens is if you don't get the seeds to, the, the heat to kill the seed germination, then you disperse that compost in your pile next spring and every seed that was in that pile now has been redistributed in your garden and begins to germinate. So we've, take some, we've taken some preliminary measures here and if we're going to pull up a thistle here, we'll cut the top off, throw the top in one container and we'll go ahead and pull the plant up. Now, some of these are going to open up uh, quite uh, soon here so we'll just take and cut anything that has a seed pod off. That'll go in the trash. This can go in our compost pile because it's just stem and root and no potential seeds that are gonna get in our compost pile. Yes, it does seem very wasteful that we're throwing out potential compost material, but in the long run, we feel that by doing this, by sorting out the seed pods from the stalks and getting rid of the seed pods, it's going to improve the health and the well-being of our garden because by leaving seeds or weeds in your garden, if you let them go to seed, you're looking at seven years of fighting to get those particular varieties eradicated from your garden. And yes, I've spoke about it on the program that weeds and leaving them in your garden or pulling them out, that is also a decision of the gardener the particular location you're gardening and the reasons why you may leave or want to take the weeds out of your garden. So before you just throw everything in the compost pile, decide and de determine what's the best route for you in your particular growing situation. 
you may not have a lot of recipes and you want to make sure you use a trusted source. I go to my Ball Blue Book Guide to Preserving. You can find this pretty much anywhere that sells books. You can find, I think I got, yeah, I got this one at Target. You can find it at different big box stores, sometimes your hardware store, your farm supply store, and even online. But there's lots of great recipes. There's anything from canning to freezing to, you know, how, how do you peel vegetables, the best way, all sorts of great information, different information about whether to pressure can or hot water bath can. So this is a really good resource. So I would recommend that if you're going to start canning, you go ahead and pick up this book because it's filled with great information. You want to make sure that when you buy this book, you buy the most up-to-date version. You don't want to use the one that your great-grandmother had or whatever. While that's fun to look through, you want to make sure that when you are using canning, re canning recipes, you're using a trusted resource and a recipe that's been made or redone or trusted in the last 10 to 15 years. So one of the keys to growing any produce is having a good seed and a good soil to start with. We're in the back side of the garden. We started this process on one of our First Garden New Gardener series episodes and what we have here is burlap sacks that we got from our local coffee roaster in town here. Now this may not be as readily available to you in the area that you live in, so you might have to look at it means of finding or using some other type of material or making your own or going to a feed store. Sometimes they have burlap sacks for bringing different uh, grains in for livestock. So what we have, we've got two, we've got three peppers here. We had four, we had two planted here and one died. We've got a black brandy wine and a green zebra and we threw in some potatoes that were sprouting later in the season that we had coming up in the uh, pantry. And we started with a good soil comp uh, base here which was the certified leaf compost from suecomposting.com. And each one of these, you basically fill it up to the point where you feel that there's adequate soil for the plant that you're planting in. Now these are the best tomatoes and the best peppers we have currently growing. We have good, good out there in the actual traditional ground garden, but for what little soil we have and what we've done here, they are very, very productive. And notice on these tomatoes, there's no blight. Now we're fighting blight in other portions of the garden because of the humidity and the moisture and the cool nights and the whole combination of a lot of things. Even though we've applied the whole grain cornmeal, we go through different spells like this every couple of years in the garden. So this may be something that you want to look into. This would be a great potential portable garden or if you have a patio porch deck or somewhere where you can't dig in the ground using burlap sacks as Grow bags is an excellent way of growing and with the potatoes when they're time to harvest we'll just pour them out, dig through the soil and put the soil either in the garden or reuse it in our burlap bags. We're taking this concept and multiplying it uh, quite a bit next year. We're going to take one of our raised berms, one that we feel that may not be as uh, soil ready and we're going to cover it with burlap sacks of about 20 2024 and grow a variety of different things, peppers, tomatoes, and, and everything that we can think of to try to experiment with the possibility of doing it on a much larger level than what we have here. So growing in burlap sacks, our tomatoes, our peppers, our potatoes have been a very, very good success story. Thanks for watching. Join us next time for more organic gardening and food preservation. I'm Joy Barrett and this has been the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. For more information, please visit the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com.